So welcome everyone. I'm Brielle Rosati and I am the program director of Berkshire Arts Center, um, formerly IS 183 Art School. So I'd like to welcome you to tonight's artist talk with local figurative painter and faculty artist at Berkshire Arts Center, Chalice Mitchell. Um, to start, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Berkshire Arts Center, who many of you may know in the past as IS 183 Art School. We are a nonprofit community art center originally based in Stockbridge. Our mission is to provide hands-on art making experiences in the visual arts to peoples of all people of all ages, means, and skill levels by offering a variety of classes and workshops, as well as artistic events like exhibits and artist talks like tonight's. So this fall, we also opened a new location on North Street in Pittsfield, where we have a number of winter classes and workshops. We have multiple free art making events that happen ongoing each month, including a makerspace, a family drop in events, and then a parent and me art making meetup. We're also hard at work currently planning spring and early summer classes, which are going to be announced soon. So those all information about all of that can be found at our website, BerkshireArtCenter.org. And before I introduce Chalice, I just have a few housekeeping notes about tonight. So first, please ensure you're muted when Chalice is presenting um, or whenever you have background noise. We're going to have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So throughout, if you have questions that come up, you're welcome to put them into the chat and then I can read it aloud during the Q&A. Um, or you can also write your name in the chat just as a reminder that I should have you ask your, ask your question at the end. Um, and then we'll also welcome any live questions that you might have at the end of the presentation. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, we're going to be recording this presentation and that recording is in progress. So I'd like to share a little bit about tonight's artist, Chalice Mitchell, as I welcome her to our virtual stage. Tonight, Chalice will discuss how her work explores the spaces in between gender, power, sensuality, religion, identity, and impermanence. Chalice will also discuss her personal and artistic journey, having studied classical oil painting in the Western lineage, conceptual art in graduate school, and ink painting in Japan. Inspired by the philosophy behind ink painting and fascinated by the sensuality of religious art in the late Renaissance and Baroque periods, these two influences intertwine in oil on raw linen. So welcome, Chalice. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. I'm always happy to um, kind of share my my artwork um, going back through kind of the slides and putting together a presentation is uh, always um, kind of a, a a nice way of revisiting some of the themes and um, I'm looking forward to questions so if you have questions uh, feel free to write them in the chat and we'll save some time at the end um, for Q a uh, so I am going to start my slideshow. Uh, bear with me for a moment. Hopefully this all goes the way <laughs> I'm trying to make it go. Does that work? <laughs> yep, perfect. <laughs> okay, so the spaces in between. This is kind of a common theme across a bunch of different subject matters. And, you know, it's just, you'll see. It's the... A, a, um, I'm always kind of resisting a binary. So I've done portraits almost all of my career as an artist. I was drawn to portraits and how they kind of encapsulate this, this balance of having to be really specific in order to get a likeness and to get the expression right, but also staying loose enough so that um, there's kind of like this lifelike quality that's retained and that that tricky balance is fascinating to me. Um, you'll notice that the background is unfinished. Um, there's some in overlapping of the figure in the background. So that's that's part of the aesthetic I like. I, I like for there to be kind of a feeling of spontaneity, like the painting has just begun. Um, I like for there to be sort of uh, loose brushwork combined with a little bit of a tighter grasp on the details. And it, cha it changes depending on the painting I'm working on or the period uh, in which I'm painting. Um, but with portraits, um, here are some that uh, I did a while ago. So 
geez, this must be 15 years ago. So you can see these ones I just showed you are more recent. Um, these were uh, pandemic portraits done over Zoom <laughs> while we were all like really hungered down. Um, and these were portraits I did, a, yeah, about 15 years ago. So you can see the style has changed quite a lot, um, but there are still some uh, similarities in terms of visible brushwork, um, interest in getting some amount of specificity, um, but also letting the background and the figure interrelate. Um, so again, this this is another uh, another uh, more recent um, body of work in portraiture um, on on linen, and I just love the texture of linen and and kind of having the materials be a part of of the finished product. I want the surface to look like what it is. I want the paint to be visible as paint, but I also want it at the same time to function as an image. Um, so it's kind of a both and thing. Um, portraits I was drawn to pretty early on. Um, there's something about portraits and kind of like that interrelationship with another person um, trying to capture something about another person um, that there's there's an element of loss in portraiture. Um, in the past, portraiture was kind of a means to remember somebody who was far away or to, to retain a memory of somebody after their death. So I had just started doing portraits. My first two portraits from life were of my brother and sister. Um, and within that year, my brother passed away. And so portraiture became like this, this grounding thing of like kind of grasping um, like that, that relationship to people that I care about and trying to preserve these moments because we don't really know how much longer we're going to have <laughs> with each other. And there's something about the portrait that I'll, I'll, probably continue to return to the rest of my career. Um, but now I'm going to move on. <laughs> so Elizabeth Condon was one of the visiting professors when I was an undergrad. And she was just this in incredible painter who was mixing abstraction with representational imagery and became very interested in Chinese painting, um, ink painting, and I became really interested in it as well. So she was a huge influence. Um, I ended up going to graduate school where she was teaching full time in order to continue that uh, relationship and that study. But you can see in her work, there's this kind of allowing the material to act as it will. Um, it's very abstract, but it's also grounded in representational images, um, which change. This is a period when she was working with flowers a lot. Um, so my work was kind of in, in an opposite but similar way influenced in kind of like this more materials-based um, use of of the space, use of the brush and the paint working both as image and as the material itself, um, kind of breaking apart um, the figure and sort of continuing with this like wabi-sabi uh, sort of aesthetic, letting things be unfinished and sometimes letting, um, I don't know, happy accidents is a sort of stupid phrase, but I'm gonna use it. <laughs> like letting a, a cool mistake stay and actually appreciating it. Um, so this, this is another uh, kind of body of work in the same period. The, these were done in grad school as was the previous slide. Um, this is on raw canvas. Um, so as, kind of experimenting with not gessoing, not using a color at that period, which eventually led to the linen 
Um, but you can see there's sort of like this attraction to minimalism while still really being interested in the figure and bodies and and um, like uh, sort of this, the humanity and um, physicality. So after grad school, I moved back to Japan um, because I loved it there the first time I lived there. So I lived in Japan twice and paid off my loans from undergrad and grad school. Um, and I taught English um, and had tons of time on weekends and evenings to paint. And I found it to be a really inspirational situation. Um, the landscape is gorgeous, as you can tell. So I'm just gonna go through a bunch of slides because I could not choose. I lived in this little fishing village. Um, this, so this is like where the front of my apartment was. I was like one block away from the ocean and the other side of my apartment looked out over these rice fields and this mountain. Um, so it was, it was pretty good. <laughs> um, this is the town that I had, um, a studio in. They ran an uh, artist in residence program, and I was part of like this the long term studio there. So this is more of like a mountain village tucked in. Um, it was just gorgeous, <laughs> but I found it really inspiring. Um, I was also studying ink painting when I was in Japan. Um, my teacher was Haruyama Sensei, and he was a retired Shinto, or, well, he was retired, and he was still a Shinto priest and a painter. And in this, you can see, it's, it's like a fairly traditional style, very loose, um, one of the traditional plant forms that is a basis for this style. But he would also branch out and do a more like modern kind of approach with subject matter that is not like within the traditional canon of ink painting. It's not like a representation of the seasons or there, there are certain themes that are common that he would kind of branch out. So when I began studying with him, he would teach me the basics, but he also, uh, he saw me as another artist and gave me free reign, which was really great. He was amazing to watch paint. Like he, he had spent so many years painting with ink. He just, it was so intuitive and getting the correct balance between the ink and the water is so difficult because the water, um, it both, there's, there are two acts axis is axi. I don't know what that word is, but it's like dark to light. And then there's dry to wet and water is in both of those. So if you want a dry light brush mark, that's pretty tricky because you need water to make it lighter, but you can't have too much because you need it to not be super wet. Uh, but he was just amazingly proficient at getting the right balance right away. <laughs> Um, so these are some of my attempts um, with ink painting. The paper is not terribly expensive and you want this kind of quick spontaneity. So I would do 20 to 30 of the same painting and then at the end choose. Um, so you can see there's my signature in English, but I also had a, a pen name because that was a common thing that you would have a different name for yourself, um, for your paintings. So my teacher gave me the name. Um, so these characters are grass and sacred. So um, yeah, so it's pronounced say so in Japanese, but the grass was part of my teacher's pen name. So I got that and the translation of chalice in Japanese is holy cup. So we kept the holy <laughs> and that's how I ended up with my ink name. And I have a really cool stamp. Um, I also did a sort of informal apprenticeship with the scroll maker. Um, so these are made out of old kimonos and I got to learn how to like cut the fabric, how to line it up, what order to place things in. Um, there are certain things that make it more difficult to do here on my own. He had 
a gigantic press to make sure that everything was perfectly flat and was, you know, kind of a, a thing that he ordered from Kyoto. It was specifically for this. Um, it's something I had hoped to continue to do here, but it's trickier. <laughs> Um, so this is part of the process. You can see parts of the kimono um, and how they were cut to begin to make the scroll. Um, over here on this side, it's my work and then um, my teacher, my painting teacher's work. So it's, um, I love this photo because it shows both of us, our work together at the framing shop and the kind of um, the way that he's influenced by Western art and the way I'm influenced by Japanese art and kind of, uh, we're both very interested in portraits in ink painting, which is not one of the most common uses of the material. Um, also, I've been a martial arts junkie my entire life. <laughs> so you can see I'm, I'm slightly younger in this picture. Um, and I, in this one, I, I continued to study martial arts while I was, well, always. So I've done a ton of different stuff um, currently and for many years have been a huge fan of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because it kind of encapsulates all those things that I was talking about, those opposites. It's, it can be really brutal. It's a fight, but also when you're training, you're working with your friends and you, you're, you're, you have partners and you're working together to improve your technique. Um, and a lot of the techniques are based on kind of timing, um, you know, this quick spontaneous feel for when somebody's moving. You don't wanna use maximum strength because you're gonna burn out. So that there's this beautiful precision in the technique and you have to flow and you have to kind of do opposite things at the same time and just uh, it's like high speed chess that's incredibly physical and I love it. <laughs> um, and so I feel like those kinds of elements are in ink painting. There's this kind of, you know, you have to be relaxed. You have to also be really precise. So it's kind of like practicing a sport. Um, and this painting here, um, some of you may have heard of Miyamoto Musashi, who was the most famous samurai in Japanese history. He was also a painter and a poet. Um, so his pen name was Niten. And so you can kind of see how those two cross over. Um, and so I started to bring more of my martial arts interest into painting. So you can see that I was looking at MMA for this. <laughs> um, and this is kind of, it's a longer scroll. So I, I'm showing it in three segments, but this is kind of like a time lapse of a fight. So uh, it's kind of the, the progression from, I'm gonna go back, you know, often a fight starts stand up. Uh, people are gauging the distance, start closing the distance with punches, kicks. Um, there's usually a takedown and, unless there's a knockout there it sometimes will end on the ground so in this fight and I did with a choke um and I began to kind of let the ink um painting and my oil painting inform each other or influence each other so I was working with a similar theme trying to get some of that spontaneity um and motion in my oil painting so the, the raw linen is also kind of there. And this one, this hand or arm is totally abstracted. There are other areas where it's, it's more concrete. The foot is unfinished. <laughs> so that's, it's kind of, again, trying to bridge across many different styles. Um, and uh, yeah, the human body is fascinating to me. I love musculature. I also really resist the stereotypes that, <laughs> that we get placed into based on gender. Um, and having been in martial arts since I was a very young kid, I guess, like eight, um, 
I really started to notice that it doesn't always apply. Like I was able to kick asses, the asses of boys in my class sometimes. And I, I just was sick of <laughs> the, um, the kind of binary that I got shoved into, or I felt like I got shoved into uh, by society as a whole. Um, and so I'm really interested in like physical strength um, of people with female bodies who are kind of breaking that boundary, um, breaking that stereotype. It's kind of like a representation of um, kind of moving out of out of those narrow categories. Um, so these are were some other paintings. Um, I'm also interested in general in like breaking out of a, a binary gender system in overall. Um, I was in, uh, involved with a queer community in Japan and most of my friends were queer, many of my models and muses. Um, so this is one of my favorite couples. Um, the two of them moved to the States and we're still close friends and they're still my muses and inspiration. Um, but yeah, uh, so we, we, I often work with models in kind of like a mutual inspiration way. I won't tell people exactly what to do. I will come up with an idea or, you know, I might have a few props and I like to kind of brainstorm together. Let you, we'll just have fun and I'll, I'll do a photo shoot and we kind of come up with the idea together and arrive at, um, you know, it, it just allows the situation to come to a place that I wouldn't have foreseen only by myself. Um, so yeah, I just had fun playing with, you know, the gender binary in these. Um, they both always enjoy that too. Um, sensuality and, and all of that stuff. Um, another thing that I should mention is I, <laughs> my dad was an Episcopalian minister. So I grew up with the church um, and living away in Japan, I, <laughs> I was going to a Buddhist country where I was getting away from all the Christianity, but I ended up just south of Nagasaki, which has like people travel there to see the churches because it's kind of got this underground Christian history. Um, and yeah, I'm just fascinated by uh, the iconography. Um, one of my favorite periods of painting in the Western tradition is the late Renaissance Venetian painting and Baroque painting. And a lot of the religious imagery that was commissioned by the church is so sensual. Um, and it's just, I found it really fascinating. So I, I decided that I was just going to dig in and <laughs> explore what that was all about. Um, so you can see, like, I feel like my paintings are pretty sensual, but when I look at an altarpiece um, by a Renaissance master or a Baroque master, I think, oh, wow, I'm not even close. <laughs> so while while I was thinking about these things, um, somebody recommended a book by Yukio Mishima to me, and it's about how he, it's sort of, it's like a semi-autobiography, and he was looking through an art book as a younger person, like 12, and he saw this painting by Guido Reni, and that's how he discovered his homosexuality, um, and I just found that fascinating. Um, so St. Sebastian is one of my favorite themes, the way it, it's, it, the imagery brings together like sensuality for sure, but also violence and, and um, kind of death. He didn't die. He didn't die in this martyrdom. He had to be killed 
a second time. He was nursed back to health. So St. Sebastian iconography took off because he represented resilience. And during the plague, he, he was a symbol for, you know, being this youthful, beautiful um, survivor when the plague was hor a horrible way to die. Um, he became an icon again during the AIDS crisis. Um, for similar reasons, um, kind of an icon of hope. Um, so, so Christian imagery is something I'm really, really interested in. And uh, the, the fact that I'm an oil painter and I paint bodies, um, I keep finding inspiration in late Renaissance and Baroque painting because those two periods were really, really all about the materiality of the paint and sort of embodying religion through a very visceral imagery um, that I, I just enjoy playing with that. <laughs> so you can see I'm, I'm, this is more recent work and I'm um, going through those same themes, kind of taking it away from quite so overt influence of religion and uh, iconography and just kind of like playing with the form, the human form um like how how is it presented how much information do i need plants started coming into my paintings um so i had an exhibition about a year ago at the plant connector in north adams and i loved having plants all around um kind of i have a i have a desire to have my exhibitions like with things besides just white walls. And so this really satisfied that urge. Um, and you can see in this St. Sebastian, there were some flowers. Um, this body of work was inspired by Titian. Um, and down here, we'll go to some more of this stuff. I began carving in marble. Um, I got a grant a few years ago. And so it's something I'd always wanted to try. Um, it's very physical, a day of carving, marble is like 10 workouts at once. Uh, and so of course I wanted to carve the human body. Um, so I was focusing on um, more like subtle nuances in terms of posture, but also boxing and um, the form anatomy. Um, I'm still, well, I mean, I often leave out heads. There are parts of the, the figure is always fragmented in my paintings and in my sculptures. So there's that. <laughs> um, I love persimmons, my favorite fruit, um, my favorite food, and probably my favorite thing of everything. Um, so I got this series of paintings that Persimmons are only around for two or three months a year. So um, this body of work is going slowly, but I like to have my friends crush a persimmon. I'll shoot video and then I'll paint from my favorite stills. I just think it's the texture is so juicy. Um, and so these are, these are some like in process. Um, and it's, yeah, there's something about the color, the richness the flavor is great, but you can't see it in the painting. Um, but the, there's something really visceral about a persimmon that I like. Um, these are more recent um, paintings that I'm kind of like playing around with, you know, like funny situations that could have implications of power. Um, I want, I kind of, playing with the idea. These are smaller um, where I'm looking at just, you know, like a hand or a foot and what, how can it interact with um, objects and, and how much information do I need? <laughs> so you can see I'm, I'm not only getting more precise in terms of detail, but I'm also kind of stepping back again 
in um, my minimalism. So these are two other reasons. I think this one's right, right there. <laughs> um, these are two other more recent ones. Um, this one is clearly smaller. Um, this one is pretty large. And I'm sort of in the process of deciding how to finish it. I don't finish paintings all at once. Usually I will take a break, come back to it, like let my eyes and my brain refresh. It's, it's definitely a mental workout um, processing and making decisions and um, the visual, the visual uh, battery I need is it runs low after about two hours. So I take breaks. Um, in this piece, I started using this gold um, stuff. Uh, I, I had a friend give me one of her ceramic pieces. It had been broken and she repaired it with um, kintsugi. It's a Japanese art of like repairing broken ceramics with, with gold. So it kind of, it makes that brokenness more beautiful. And it's, it's, it was very symbolic for her to give it to me at that time in her life. And then when she gave it to me, I just valued it so much because I was also going through a really hard time. Um, and there was this, I, I just found comfort in like the fact that something could be broken and you're going to draw attention to those broken pieces and make them sparkle and shine and fix it essentially. <laughs> And so I, I started, um, I, I played with putting that into this painting because it felt right. Um, this painting, I think I'm going to name Kintsugi Kiniku Kinbaku because Kintsugi is the, the repairing. Um, Kiniku is muscle and I'm totally interested in musculature and like the physicality of the human form. And Kinbaku is, it's like in the US, we call it shibari most of the time and it's bondage, which is commonly how St. Sebastian gets identified. <laughs> um, and so there's kind of like, in some ways I feel like those three things are coming together in this painting and maybe because it's, uh, it's at the intersection of all of those things that I'm kind of at a standstill of where I want to go next with it, if it's finished or not. And sometimes it, it takes a couple of hours. Sometimes it takes a couple of weeks. I've gone back into paintings after a few years and been like, oh, I know what that needs. <laughs> um, so this painting might be one of those. Um, I also think that I, at my last slide, and I could have gone pretty fast. <laughs> so we can open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Chalice. I appreciate it. It's so funny before we go for questions, I just want to say how throughout I felt found myself coming up with questions and then you answering them immediately. This thing that you just touched on of how you intentionally leave your work open so that it has that sense of sort of spontaneity and movement and like, how do you know when it's done, when that happens? It's interesting that you mentioned kind of at the end there how you sometimes don't and how sometimes you change your mind about when it's done and when it's not. Do you find that that happens often that you revisit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it happens more often than I plan for it to happen. <laughs> yeah, there have been paintings that I was like, there are paintings that I've shown several times. And then one day I'll look at it in the studio and be like, and I will, I'll, repaint a part or add something new <laughs> that kind of adds to that feeling of life and the movement because it's constantly it like has that you're leaving that space for them to sort of evolve and finish as years go by mm -hmm. um, and anyone else who has questions at this time you're welcome to put them in the chat you can turn your camera on and actually raise your hand or you can use the feature to raise your hand so I can call on you um it's kind of pretty open in that way. 
however you'd like to ask a question. Yeah, any questions are welcome. I am incredibly good at forgetting stuff, so I'm sure I've forgotten to talk about something. Um, I have an, oh, someone, I actually, somebody has a hand up. Lucy, you have a question you'd like to ask? I do. I am wondering, Chalice, what your studio is like. And it's kind of like a three-part question of where, where you work. Is it in the studio? What is it like? And maybe like, what's your favorite element or what's something that, you know, you walk in and it brings you joy? <laughs> oh, hmm. I forgot, I forgot the first question. So my studio, I have, a, well, currently my computer is on, uh, I can't do this. Oh my God, look, okay, this is my <laughs> painting table. Um, so my, I have like a an ink painting station sort of um, easel. I like painting on an easel. I know it's super traditional, but I like that I can move it around and not just be, like at a wall. Um, I have sort of like this stand-up drawing desk thing. I, I'm i sitting now, but I actually hate sitting. <laughs> so it, when I'm drawing typically uh, or painting or doing ink painting, I'm almost always standing. Um, and I have this wicked cool couch that was my grandmother's. So Maybe, yeah, I don't know. I love to surround my studio with, um, you know, my favorite work that I've done um, and like just gaudy furniture or, <laughs> you know, stuff that I find really fascinating. Um, yeah. That really yeah. suits you. I'm like, as you're scanning through and especially the couch, it's all like your color palette in your work and yeah a lot of the the style and some images like that I would see in some of the paintings that clearly inspire you mm -hmm. yeah and sometimes it like the the palette my palette will reflect where I live or have recently lived and sometimes I don't really notice that shift until after I've moved or several years in so there was a period I was painting in just pastels it was hideous I lived in Florida. <laughs> yeah, you didn't see any of that work because it was hideous. <laughs> but yeah, that's a really good question. Like what element in my studio brings me joy? Because that I try to make my studio really like enticing because sometimes it's hard to find the motivation. Um, it's, it's tiring. Painting is tiring. Um, and when I'm not having fun painting, I know something's wrong. Yeah. Any other questions? I think I saw some chats popping up. Yeah, we have. So in the chat, Linda mentioned that she too was interested in you taking your visual break from your work and coming back to it. I don't think it was much of a question as much of a comment on the last question. Mm -hmm. um, but then after that, Sherry asked, how do you typically start a painting and do you sketch it out? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, yeah, sometimes, well, let's see. I do kind of have like, I might do studies. So these are, these are some recent studies um, that I've been doing that are a little bit smaller. So I might do a study and then decide I want to do a larger one on um on linen on a stretched canvas um sometimes like if i have a specific idea in mind and i do a, um, a shoot with a model i might do a few sketches from different photos in the series and then decide what i want to do um sometimes i work from life um which since the pandemic has gotten a lot more rare. <laughs> um, yeah, and sometimes like, sometimes 
I'll just, uh, I don't plan out everything. Um, I get really bored if I know exactly what everything is going to be. So there's always this kind of, at the beginning of a painting, I don't know what it's really going to look at, like, sorry. I don't really know what it's going to look like at the end, um, like where I'm going to leave the empty space, where I'm going to fill it in. I, I feel like in some ways it's a conversation. Like there's my start on the canvas and then the painting starts to dictate what it needs. And it's like this back and forth. That sounds kind of silly, but that's, it's like, I'll start and one brushstroke will lead to the other. Um, in in a way it's kind of uh call and response so it's not like I'm planning every step I want to kind of be able to roll the punches so sorry for the Very rambling good. answer so interesting. <laughs> thank you so that answer is definitely helpful and sort of an as a follow-up to that there's another question of for portraits do you more often work from life or an image mm -hmm. still and which one do you prefer I Huh. Well, <laughs> if it's a commissioned portrait, I usually prefer to shoot my own photos. Um, some people are better at staying still than others. So if somebody is pretty fidgety, it's really, really tough to work from life. Uh, for kids, always photos. Um, but some of my best portraits have been from life. Um, and there's, there's something the like, painting a portrait from life if you have a good model who doesn't move a bunch and you you know I find often my best portraits are of somebody that I've drawn and painted several times because you get to familiarize yourself with with you know the specific anatomy of their face or their specific kind of like way of holding themselves and those after several times, some of that information actually becomes a bit intuitive. So you get a better likeness and you get a better sense of the person. Um, it's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, that definitely sounds really interesting. I love that idea that you sort of like get to know them better through trying again and again. That's, that's really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. I, I have another question too. Um, this is from Linda. Are you inspired by the seasons or by your mood or by social interactions? Hmm. I, yeah, maybe. Um, I think definitely my mood. I feel like this, at this age, the seasons go so fast. I can't track it. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely my mood and social interactions in terms of being inspired by my models a lot of the time or fellow artists, um, yeah, I, I think there are certain social interactions that because because I'm painting people, um, people are an inspiration. It sounds to me like you definitely value the interpersonal aspects of art making. Sometimes I know art making can become a solitary thing in a lot of ways, but you have talked about mentorships that you had or your informal apprenticeship about how you think of models as sort of collaborators in the process. And it's really nice to hear that, how that influences your work and how you value that interconnectivity involved in it all. Um, let's see, I have another question for you too, if you're ready for it. This one is, have you worked in any other mediums in addition to ink, marble, paint, ones that you went over today, obviously, and do you have any dislikes and likes about those? Oh, yeah, I've worked in other mediums of photography. I've I'm like an amateur photographer. <laughs> I just got four rolls of film back. <laughs> and some of them are in focus. Um, I have done some video work. I've done some performance art stuff. Um, I did some animation, like kind of really experimental animation. Actually, my grad school thesis was uh, like a painterly um like uh, basically a motion painting. It was experimental experimental animation and kind of like a stop motion mode. Um, I love the way it looks. I hated the process. I hated, you know, just the, and then having to edit it in the computer and figure out the technology, getting it to project right. Um, so 
yeah, I don't know. I still, I still use video software for some stuff, but I could not do that for my entire practice. Um, I don't do digital photography at all. I only use my digital camera for documenting my artwork or shooting like with the model. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think I feel overwhelmed by the amount of computer time in general in life. So I don't do a lot of art making with it. Yeah, um, that that helps you be able to keep it sort of as a separate outlet with, when if you were using the computer a lot more for your art then it would definitely be I guess more daunting in that way yeah you can do super cool stuff on the computer I just don't have the I, it's just not not for me yeah um so Katie wants to know if you can speak a little more about your sculpture work what were mm -hmm. you interested in that medium and what do you like about it um, what I was interested in at first was kind of like a sculpture in marble is kind of like this very grandiose thing. Um, and at first I think I, I remember seeing like sculptures of these heterosexual or <laughs> hetero couples kissing and, and stuff like that. And I just, you know, I wanted to kind of switch it up. I remember in high school, I wanted to make a kiss but with two women. Um, and I was like, when I go to school, I'm going to carve this giant marble sculpture of two women kissing. And, and then I got this grant and I was like, I'm going to carve big marble sculptures. And like a sculpture like this is so heavy and so time consuming. <laughs> um, I think I had underestimated the amount of physical labor that goes into it. Um, yeah, it just, um, that's, that's one thing that surprised me about it, but also that I really enjoyed because my paint, I paint quickly. Um, but with marble sculpture, I can do one, like it takes months. Me, like there's one I've been working on for a year and a half, you know, there's roughing it out. There's kind of, you know, refining it. And then you get down to filing. I have this really gorgeous, file made out of diamonds that is great like marble is actually a fairly soft stone so it, it's it's really great to work with and you never know where the veins in it are going to lie until you get down to the form so there's a little bit of surprise you also never know where when you're going to make a mistake and like knock off a piece that you didn't mean to <laughs> so there's a little spontaneity Thank you. I have another marble related question too. Did you go to a facility or separate studio for your marble work or do you do that? Okay. I, yeah, I, um, I was living up in North Adams um, and I did a one week workshop uh, at the carving studio, wait, carving studio sculpture center. I always mix the two up. Um, they have a long name <laughs> in Rutland, Vermont. It's great. They provide the materials. They have all the tools. They have really expert teachers, some who've studied in Italy. Um, and so I continued to go up there for the majority of my carving because they, they have everything that you need. And especially because I was buying my stone from them, my, my, uh, three sculptures to date are like 70 to hundred pounds. But when I started carving those chunks of stone, they were 300 pounds. So that's not really something you can buy and bring home to your, or like bring to your own studio. And marble dust is kind of like, it gets everywhere. So, um, no. <laughs> Now that you've gotten a chance to try it out and seen kind of how heavy it is and how time consuming it all is, is that something you think you're going to pursue long term? Was it something that you had sort of dreamed about from the time you were young and gave it a go and now maybe isn't going to be something you move forward with? How is your feeling about it now? I am not going to do giant sculptures and <laughs> public commission and many assistants. Yeah. Um, but I am going to keep carving and I, I'm going to keep it small because it's actually kind of backbreaking work. For people who are exclusively marble carvers or sculptors who work in marble, um, they really have to be careful about their joints, their back, 
um, it, it can be really, really brutal on your body long-term if you're, sort of, if you're carving eight hours a day, every day. Yeah, I'm sure. And it's sort of interesting how that also kind of relates to what you were touching on before about the martial arts and everything and how there's sort mm -hmm. of a relation between the two. It's interesting yeah. the same yeah, kind of components. <laughs> Um, I have another question for you. Uh, can you talk a little more about the process allowing the painting to speak for itself, like the back and forth between artist and art piece? Also curious about how pieces in different media speak to each other. Ooh, ooh, I, I think that's two very good questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the back and forth with the painting, I think there's some, you know, I, I allow for some unknowns in resolving the painting and I enjoy kind of you know like I'll make a few moves and then you know I might I might you need to step take a step back and look and think well the painting does the painting want this area like this part of the background to be black does it want it to be white do I need a contrast here do I need to take down this you know, this edge, do I need to make that more subtle? Um, and so there's kind of like this step by step, I guess I'm going to make a chess analogy again, you know, like, I make one move, my opponent makes another move, I make another move. <laughs> but maybe I'm just doing it with myself, and I'm projecting the other side as the painting. <laughs> and the other question, how do different mediums speak to each other? Um, they all, they all kind of like inhabit a slightly different, like ink painting and oil painting. They're both painting. They both involve paint or ink, the brush, a surface. Um, but some of the differences, like the ink is very fluid. Um, once it touches the paper, that's it. It's there. Um, so it requires like this spontaneity. You can't be timid and like lay down a line. It's just going to go. So you have to, you have to be decisive. Um, and in some ways that has, you know, inspired me to be more uh, kind of brave in my brush handling and oil. Um, but also oil, like you can build up the paint in oil. You can't really do that in ink painting. And of course, sculpture is, is very different, but the marble sculpture, um, I had been thinking of my painting as the oil painting as carving actually before I started <laughs> carving marble because I often work with planes and shapes and will like paint, paint one part and then be like, put the background over it and basically like carve the outline. I don't know if that makes sense with words. Um, but I think of my fig figurative painting and oils as a sculptural kind of endeavor. Um, and so actually carving in marble helped me think more three-dimensionally. Um, yeah, so um, those are just those three in interrelationship because those are the three that I am currently taking seriously <laughs> in terms of my practice. Thank you. And that's so interesting to hear that you think of your painting work as sculptural too. I love, I love hearing that and kind of it gives it a different interpretation. Like when I'm looking at it, I'll think of that differently. That's cool. Um, oh, cool. I think we maybe have time for one more question. We have about two minutes left. If anybody has one last one that they want to throw out there. Um, see mm -hmm. if there's any hands. Otherwise I have a couple closing things I just want to mention. So, um, anything else? No. Okay. I think, yeah. Very inspiring. Absolutely. Very inspiring. So Chalice, thank you so much for being here with us tonight and sharing all about your process and your work. Um, I do want to share with the group some upcoming things that are happening at the art school. Chalice is offering some workshops at BAC, which are all open for registration. First, she's teaching an ink painting workshop focusing on the plum blossom, and that's on Sunday, February 5th. So that's right around the corner. So sign up for that um, over at our website. 
Next, she's leading a figure painting workshop on Sunday, March 5th. And lastly, this winter, she'll be teaching a portrait painting workshop that's on Sunday, March 19th. So those and many more of our upcoming workshops and classes can all be found at berkshireartcenter.org. So thank you, Chalice, again, for being here. And thank you, everyone else, for being here. Um, yeah, I hope thank, you have a thank wonderful Thank you for inviting me yeah, to do this. Of course, this. we're I, so happy I to have a, you. This has been amazing. I had a good time. And thank you. <laughs> And Charles, make sure you're looking at the chat too. It says very inspiring, marvelous. Thank you. Everyone's really enjoying it. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Night. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>